Well, good morning again. It is good to be together. I, um, I was thinking this week, I, it was the summer of 2005. Whoop. We're going to skip that part. I'm all right. <laughs> Uh, It was the summer of 2005 when um, many of us were glued to our TVs as we watched the um, aftermath and devastation of Hurricane Katrina. Um, This this, this, just this horrible onset. If you remember, we saw images like this where there'd been just communities that were completely wiped out and the only remains of any sign of of activity was just debris. Um, that was left in the wake of this. And I had the opportunity to go down about a year later with a group of students that was a part of the um, recovery effort, part of the rebuilding effort. And so we went down there and um, we were out in the suburbs outside of New Orleans a bit and um, meeting with different people and interacting with them. And what I realized is that in the midst of this devastation and the despair that they had experienced as a result of this hurricane, people seem to be in, in a couple different places. One, you had, you had the people that their reaction to what they had experienced was to begin the process of rebuilding, to, to start cleaning up, to move everything aside, to um, start reestablishing a foundation and to rebuild the communities that they had lost. Their reaction was to take action in the midst of it. Others, were almost paralyzed by what they had experienced. The, the fear and the uncertainty, the questions that remained, what, what if this happens again, just left them, and it was perfectly understandable, but left them in a state of almost, um, well, paralysis. Like an inability to, to even take that first step. Where do we go from here? What does this look like? So as we've been entering into the book of Ruth together, what we discover is that there are people who have experienced tragedy, Ruth and Naomi, and they are in two very different places. If you were here last week, we began looking at this ancient story of a woman named Naomi and her family and her daughter-in-law, Ruth. And, And if you... Remember the story, it begins with this journey to Moab. There's, there's famine in the land in Bethlehem and God's promised land. And so Elimelech, Naomi's husband, and, and Naomi decide to take their family and to move to the country of Moab, far outside of God's promise, provision, and protection. In fact, it was, it was a country that was far from God from their very beginnings. And they go there because there's food there. And the story goes from, from bad to worse. When they arrive, we don't know the entire timeline, but Elimelech passes away. Naomi and Elimelech's two sons marry Moabite women, and after they're married, yet they don't have any children, both of those sons pass away. And so now Naomi is left there with her two daughter-in-laws, which in this ancient culture was about as desperate as you could be. Very little means to provide for yourself, very little means to take care of of the people that you love and that are there with you in this moment. So Ruth and Naomi and her other daughter-in-law Orpah get word that there's food back in Bethlehem, that, that God's blessing has returned. And so, so Naomi feeling very much like God has abandoned her, not that he no longer sees her, decides to uproot once again and to head back to Bethlehem. And on the journey back, she, she says to her two daughter-in-laws that, that it would be best for you if you stayed in Moab. The, the best possibility of a future that you could look forward to remains here with your families. And, and Orpah takes her up on it. She, she agrees with her. It's, it's tearful, but she decides to stay. Ruth, on the other hand, makes this this incredibly risky, but incredibly faith-based decision. There's something that she has experienced, something about Naomi and Elimelech's God that she says, I want to go with you. In fact, she says in sort of this covenantal language, she says, your people will be my people and your God will be my God. 
And so Ruth and Naomi go back. In fact, when everybody sees Naomi coming back into Bethlehem, they ask themselves the question, can this, can this really be Naomi? She says, I left full, but I am, I am now returning empty. But at the very end of chapter one, despite this, this dreary picture of despair and, and despite all the loss and grief that Naomi and Ruth have experienced, there's this little glimpse of hope. This, this hope in the midst of despair. And you see that, that maybe this isn't how the story ends. In Ruth chapter 1, verse 22, the very last verse in this, in this chapter says, So Naomi returned from Moab accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem just as the barley harvest was beginning. So the story begins in famine, and as they're returning to Bethlehem, there's harvest. There's this glimpse that, that this isn't how the story ends. This isn't where it is. This is where we pick things up now in Ruth chapter 2. Turn there with me. Uh, these will be on the screen as well, but we're going to work our way through the first half of this chapter together this morning. Ruth chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. So the first thing that we see at this stage of the story is that Ruth goes in search of favor. She goes out in search of favor. I don't know if you have ever you found yourself in a circumstance or a situation where you are completely unable to, to solve your own problem, to meet your own need. Like it's a, it's a, that's sort of a sick feeling when you find yourself in that place. When Sherry and I were engaged, um, this was my senior year at Moody, she lived and her family lived in Bartlett. And, and so we, on the weekends, oftentimes would go out and hang out with her family and do different things. I'd driven out there multiple times, but she was always with me. So when spring break came, we decided to stay there in, in the Chicagoland area. And I had a job at a coffee shop so I could work and make some money. And we were preparing to be married. And, and I went down, drove into the city and did fine and worked my shift and was on my way back to Bartlett and got hopelessly and desperately lost. Now, like for those of you that are like below the age of 30, like back in those days, this was a desperate situation. <laughs> we, we did not have GPS. I, did, I didn't, their cell phones existed, but they weren't like common, certainly not common for a poor college kid. And, and I, I got so lost that I was completely turned around. And so I pulled over to some gas station and I recognized I didn't even have a quarter in my car to use on a pay phone. Again, a pay phone was like this. Um, they had these around and you could make calls, but you had to pay for it. Hence the name. And, and so I literally stood outside of this gas station um, begging, basically. Does anybody have a quarter? Anybody? Like as people are coming out, so eventually somebody took, uh, had mercy on me and gave me some, some spare change to be able to make the phone call. And I got the change and I go to the payphone. I realized I don't know their phone number. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know my in-laws, uh, home phone number. So I was like, well, now I've got a handful of change, but I don't, I can't do anything with it. And if it hadn't been for the mercy of this one particular stranger who listened to my whole story and helped me orient myself and at least got me in the general direction of Bartlett, Illinois, I, I could still be wandering out there to this day, like just lost forever. Because I did not have the means, the ability, in and of, I was completely dependent on somebody else interceding on my behalf. And this is, this is where we find Ruth in this story. She is in a state of despair, but it is a state of hopeful desperation. And she says to Naomi, I want to go out and I am going to go search for favor. Now notice here in verse one, before we get too far, the, the narrator here gives us this, this little parenthetical glimpse that something else is going on by inter introducing us to, to a new character, a man by the name of Boaz. So just kind of hold on to that for a second as we work through this. But for the moment, I want to come back to, to 
this sense of need that Naomi and Ruth are operating out of that they're experiencing and how this is motivating or sending them out and where they're at in, in the process of this. See, in the Old Testament, God had provided a provision for those in need. He, he had provided a way for, in that ancient culture, for, for the landowners in the area to leave um, space in their fields for people to come and glean who had no other provision for food. And so that, that indication, they were arriving just at the time of the barley harvest, that, that's significant because there is, they're arriving at a time when God has made a way for the people to provide for themselves. In fact, if you look over in Leviticus chapter 19, this is uh, verses 9 and 10. This is, this is that provision. He says, when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over a vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord, your God. But we're also reminded that Naomi and Ruth are living in what's known as the time of the judges. A time when it's described as everyone's doing what was right in their own eyes. So, so there's this provision that's put in place for them, and yet there's no sort of certainty in this season of the history of Israel that people are, are maintaining that provision. In fact, as we read through Ruth chapter 2, we're going to discover that Ruth is, is taking a significant risk to, to go out and to glean in these fields on her own as a Moabite widow, a, a refugee in the area but she feels like this is, this is her only option. And she goes out in search of favor. Her hope, her desire is not only what the law would provide for you, for her, but her hope was for more. Her hope was to find favor. Now that, that word that's translated favor, like so many words in the Hebrew language, it, it carries like a, a level of depth or layers to it that it's difficult to translate in one single word in the English. First, the root word for the Hebrew word carries a sense of, of hierarchy to it. So it means in, the, in this idea of finding favor that there is, that these are unequal relationships, that one person is superior to the other. The second thing that we need to understand is that also this, this word carries a sense of, of provision and protection. Where literally, where, where the idea of, of, in the Hebrew, of like coming inside the camp. So where everything on the outside, you were vulnerable in, in the camp of Israel, there was protection and provision for you. And so this is the, the sort of the background of this word. Some, some have chosen, in fact, to translate this word as, as grace. This, this picture of an unequal relationship inside of which you find provision and protection. And this is what Naomi goes in search of. She doesn't just only look to meet their basic needs. She has hope of something greater. Ruth's desire is to find favor, to find protection and provision for what she lacks from someone who has an ability and a capacity greater than her own. Ruth recognizes what her and Naomi need most, and she goes in search for it. Now, before I move on here, I, I want to just process for a moment just kind of where Ruth and Naomi are at in this story. On the one hand, we see Ruth, and she seems determined, um, proactive, taking action. She wants to go out in, in search of, of someone who will come to their rescue, someone who will provide this favor. On the other hand, life in Moab for Naomi has left her in this sort of residual place of despair. She, she seems incapable in some ways, of, of moving past the loss and the grief. Perhaps for Naomi, this is a sense of shame. 
Perhaps the, the decision to move her family outside of the covenant relationship of Israel into Moab, perhaps for her, she is feeling like we did everything wrong. Perhaps she feels like all that's happened to her is justified. We don't know. But all we know is that she seems stuck there. And the thing that stands out to me as I read this is that I recognize both of these. Not, not only do I recognize it in sort of a collaborative corporate experience of life, I recognize both of them in myself. Moments when whatever is going on, particularly when it's difficult, has felt like too much to overcome. And so my only option is to sort of reside there, to, to be stuck there. But, but Naomi leaves in pursuit of something greater. And if I've discovered anything from my own mistakes and, and from my own experience in life, is that when this is our reality, when this is the situation that we find ourselves, it's better to go in search of grace. It's better to go live under grace. So this leads us now, the second thing that we see in this story, this search that Ruth undertakes, leads us to the place of an experience of favor. It leads us into the experience of favor. You all know, most of you know, I'm, I'm somewhat of a sports fan, and uh, one of my, my favorites is college football. And um, ESPN started to do this thing on the college football national championship, which it's, it's been a little while since Ohio State's been in there, but um, they would do this thing where they would offer on all their different channels various perspectives on the game. So you could watch kind of their main line channel and you could just see it kind of as you would typically watch a football game. Or you could go to what they call these mega cast channels and they'd have the game on, but then they would also have all of these different people sort of, you're watching other people watch the game. Former players, other coaches from their, their conferences, that sort of thing. And it's all, it's, to be honest, it's a little overwhelming. Like I, I couldn't take in all of that information and at the same time, but it was really unique. And the way they kind of marketed this whole idea to the people was to watch this game from a whole new perspective, to see the game from a whole new perspective. See, this is what I find fascinating about the book of Ruth. As, as the author is telling us this story, we see what's taking place from two simultaneous perspectives. First, it's told from the point of view of, of Ruth and Naomi, a point of view that we understand, that we can relate to. It's the way that we see things as it comes to us. It comes with the limitations of being finite beings. It comes with, with the limitations of our own flesh and blood, but we recognize it and we understand it and we can relate to it because it makes sense to us. It's how we see all that's unfolding around us, but the narrator is, is sort of laying on top of this, this additional perspective. A perspective that is viewing what's unfolding in Ruth and Naomi's life through the lens of, of a sovereign God who is acting in his providence on their behalf. And all of this, at the time, this remains hidden to Ruth and Naomi, but we get this, this glimpse into it. And so as we re-enter this story, try to look for both of these perspectives. This is back in verse 3 now of Ruth chapter 2. So she, meaning uh, Ruth, went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field behind, belonging to Boaz, who is from the clan of Elimelech. Now that phrase there, as... As it turned out, it's, it's almost like a, uh, almost like sarcasm in a slight way, like, like, oh, so it just sort of worked out in, in the Hebrew language. Like, this is displaying God's providence in the midst of the circumstance. You see it again in verse four. He says, just then Boaz arrived in Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you. And they answered. And so it's, it's simultaneously showing God's sovereign activity laid over what Ruth is experiencing. Boaz asked the overseer of the harvesters, why does this, or who does this young woman belong to? The overseer replied, she is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. So she came into the field and has remained here from morning until now, except for a short rest in the shelter. This, this, this 
description by the overseer here, by the way. It's, it's, it's almost as if he is saying to Boaz, the owner of this field, like, hey, she showed up. We're not really sure who she is. She's been here all morning. We haven't been able to get rid of her. Like it's, the overseer is kind of trying to sort of explain away why she's here. Maybe even a little bit concerned, like Boaz is kind of like, who is this person and why have you let her on my land? Then Boaz does something extraordinary, verse 8. So Boaz said to Ruth, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the, woman who, with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And wherever you go, whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the jars that the men have fell filled and at this she bowed down her face to the ground and she asked him why have I found such favor in your eyes that you noticed me a foreigner now Boaz enters the scene here if you think back to that that verse one when we're first introduced to this character there's a couple things that the narrator mentions that are important first he tells us that that Boaz is a family member that he's from the clan of Elimelech. He's in the extended family of Naomi's husband. But secondly, he is a man, it says, of standing in the community. Again, this is, this is a compound word in the Hebrew. It, it, it carries with it both a sense of, of reputation, character, um, uh, how you're seen in the community, but it also carries with it a, a sense of wealth, a, a sense of capacity. So when it says that he is a man of standing, it's talking both about his, his character, but also about his capability. Now, again, remember what the word favor means. Unequal in status, but providing protection and provision. Again, that's just as a side note here, out of curiosity, but if, if you are Naomi and you come back and you have this family member, a person of good character living in Bethlehem who has the means to intercede in the midst of your desperation, wouldn't you go there? Like, what, doesn't it make sense to, to go to Boaz and help? It seems like the instinctive thing to do. Um, again, we're not told why this is, this is speculative, but again, I think it's a reflection of where Naomi is at in this part of the story, ne Ruth doesn't show up there because Naomi told her, hey, go work in the field of Boaz. R Ruth, we see, shows up here really because of the providence of God, because of his sovereignty in her life. Whatever the reason, Boaz now arrives in the field. He comes out of Bethlehem and, and he goes to the field and he takes notice of of Ruth working there. He sees somebody that he doesn't recognize and he, in this sort of ancient culture way, he essentially asks his overseer, what's, what's her story? Who does this woman belong to? He asks. Again, the overseer sort of explains who she is and why she's there. And then Boaz does this incredible thing. Look at the way that he speaks to her. This is back in verse eight and nine. I want us to see this. First, he says to her, my daughter, listen to me. See, Boaz, Boaz speaks to Ruth in relational and in compassionate terms. So she's no longer just Ruth the Moabite, this, this outsider. He is addressing her with respect and gives her dignity. My daughter, I want you to, to hear me. And then he says to her, stay here. Stay here with us. He changes her status. She's no longer just there to glean the leftovers. He actually exceeds sort of every cultural expectation and norm and gives her a position as more of an employee on her team that she can work alongside of, of the other women, which he says, he says, work with me. He's providing belonging to her. See, belonging is a powerful thing. And I remember when I was a, a middle school student, I, I'm four years younger than my older brother. So I am perfectly aligned that whatever stage of life he was in, I was, I was perfectly situated to annoy him, right? So when he was in high school, I was in middle school, and, and, and we just, that was kind of our story. And I can remember when he was a freshman in college and I was a freshman in high school, I went up to visit him at Taylor University. And um, 
And I remember that when I was there, and when you're a freshman in high school, there's, there's nothing better than college people, right? I mean, I remember my older brother kind of like taking me under his wing and, and walking me around campus and showing me and including me what his and his friends were doing. It was like our whole relationship changed. Like he brought me into this place of belonging. And, and, I, and it, was, it made such an impact in my life because I, I saw him differently because he chose to see me differently. So this is what we see unfolding here between Boaz and Ruth. He says, no one will lay a hand on you. You are now, Ruth, you are under, again, this, this is an indication of the risk that Ruth has taken. He's saying, you're under my protection now, Ruth. And he says, drink from my water jars. You have access to my provision. See, Boaz is more than just a nice guy. Ruth had left Naomi's side in search of favor, and she arrived in the field of a stranger, finding much more than she even hoped for. Much more than just gleaning rights. She's given favor. Boaz offers compassion and belonging and security and provision. See, for Ruth, Boaz is the experience of God's favor. God's favor is going to be demonstrated to her through a person. Hold, hold on to that as this story continues. Someone who has the character and the capacity to do what she could not do for herself and intercedes on her behalf. And Ruth, in response to all of this, in verse 10, it says, at this, she bowed with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you have noticed me a foreigner? And then Boaz does something I think is so powerful here because he says this, this favor that you are experiencing here with me, I want to point you, I want you to have or experience an even greater favor. I want you to have, and this is the third thing we see here, I want you to experience the refuge of God's favor. The refuge of God's favor, verse 11 now. So Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you left your father and mother in the homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. And may I continue to find favor. This is Ruth now. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. See, what Boaz describes for Ruth is, is a refuge found in relationship, in covenant relationship with Yahweh. When I was a student at Moody Bible Institute, our, our, at this time in the, in the early 90s, um, Moody in Chicago was directly um, next to the notorious projects Cabrini Green. Um, there's, there's been documentaries that have been made about, about Cabrini and about what life was like there and some of the challenges that people faced. And, and it, was, it was known widely for its violence and its gain activities and for the poverty that was experienced there. And yet what was unique is that Moody students had the ability, the, the opportunity to go and interact in Cabrini when that was sort of off limits to everyone else that you could go in there and, and there was this partnership that took place between the community and the students in terms of these big brother, big sisters programs. And you had all these opportunities to go and interact with families and there was safety that was provided for you by the community. You were welcome in there. It was this, it was this refuge that was experienced as the result of relationship, years and years of partnership together where there was a combined belief that both parties were, were looking out for each other that they were there for each other. And this is what Boaz is describing what he wants for Ruth. I want you to experience the refuge of God's favor, the protection of his wings. We remember how this whole, this whole story is unfolding. What has Ruth and Naomi have experienced up to this point? Now, Boaz has heard the story. He's heard of Ruth's love and her loyalty towards Naomi. He heard of this incredible statement of faith that she makes when she says, your God will be my God, your people will be my people. And he's seen all of this. He's seen the courage that now results of this faith that she has. And in midst of all of that, he says, may you be richly rewarded by the Lord, 
the God of Israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Ruth, may you experience the favor that is a relationship with Yahweh. May, may you come, and there's that, that, that picture of those wings is this, this picture of sort of a mother bird who provides, who provides protection for her little ones. He's inviting Ruth, this outsider, into relationship with Yahweh. May you experience an even greater favor. The greater favor that comes from a relationship with our creator, God, the refuge of God's favor the protection and provision that is available through him. You see, Ruth's story is telling us, it reveals to us the very heart of the gospel. As it continues to build now, we're gonna see more and more of of how God is working and moving towards a greater end, towards the truest experience of, of this refuge that's described here. How this is ultimately available to us. This is beyond what Ruth and Naomi ever imagined. This is beyond what they even sought out. But Boaz invites Ruth in to experience the favor of his creator, God. This is, this is what God does for us. This is why I think that translation of that word grace makes so much sense in my head because it's an unequal relationship by which we are invited into his protection and his provision. We discover it in relationship with him. This morning, as we close, we have the opportunity to respond in worship through coming to the table together, which I, I, I is just such a perfect, tangible reminder of God's grace, this favor, what's available to us through what Jesus has accomplished on our behalf. An unequal relationship, one where we have a need that we can't meet and that he intercedes on our behalf. We're reminded of that in, in the cup. And we're reminded of that in the bread, of what he has accomplished on our behalf. In the moment, I'm going to pray for us. And as I do, the ushers will come and begin to pass the elements. You can grab both cups. They're stacked on top of each other and just hold on to those for a moment. I will come back and lead us. If you're new with us this morning, you are welcome to take communion. Our our only stipulation that we see in scripture is that we are in a relationship with Jesus as our savior that's true of you this morning, um, you're welcome to take communion with us. If you're still working that out, if you're still experiencing that, it's absolutely okay to let the plate pass you by. I would pray that this would just be a time for you just to see this tangible picture of what grace looks like. Would you pray with me and we'll receive the bread and the cup together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time to be together as community. We thank you that we come to the table as a reminder of your favor, your grace poured out to us. May we experience that again this morning. It's in your name we pray, amen.